Hi everyone and welcome back to my top 500 games and we are continuing on from number 272 which is Aladdin the Mega Drive version not the Super Nintendo version the Mega Drive version I got this game one birthday I don't remember exactly what birthday it is it would have been somewhere in the mid 90s around that time and the main thing that I remember about this birthday is that I was so bored because I got Aladdin and I had a birthday party not, not saying that I was bored because I had Aladdin I was bored because I had a birthday party around at my house so I had a bunch of kids from school over at my house and we all sat and watched 101 Dalmatians and I was bored because all I wanted to do was to go up into my room and play Aladdin so yeah I had a rather boring birthday <laughs> but anyway it's a side-scrolling 2D platformer which my friend Thomas also actually had this game as well I don't remember if he had it first and then I saw it from him and that's what made me want it or whether I just got it originally and later on I found out that he also had it. But when I was a kid, I really liked Aladdin. It was one of those films that I just watched over and over again. So I wouldn't have put it past my parents that have seen it in a shop and then just bought it for me because they figured I would have liked it. And I did. So it's basically a platform game. You have a sword as a weapon to attack the enemies. You could also throw apples. Apples are sort of like this limited resource. But you can also like collect diamonds and stuff that will give you bonuses for when you complete the levels. And you can also get the Abu thing which will allow you to play a bonus stage where you play as Abu at the end of every level. And the levels basically go through the different stages of the film. Although it's not exactly one for one. You'll have you know, Agrabah, then you'll have the desert, and then you'll and you'll have the Cave of Wonders, you know, you've got all of the different levels. I think perhaps the most infamous level of this game is the chase in the Cave of Wonders where it's collapsing and all the lava is spewing everywhere and you have to dodge all of these rocks. You're on the magic carpet and you've got the genie hand pointing you in the right direction as to which way you have to go to dodge the rocks, but sometimes it just shows you a question mark so you have to guess. That was quite a bit of a nightmare. And I did complete this game. This game, I don't think it was too hard. I think I didn't really struggle with this game. But a big story I have about this game mostly is about the fact that I was scared about getting a game over. Because when you get a game over, what happens is it pops up with an image of Jafar and he's laughing and it was kind of like a jump scare and I didn't like it it just appeared and he go ah, ha, ha, and I didn't like it I found it quite scary so that was the issue that I had but I did complete the game and it was it was fine number 271 is also a game I got one birthday but a much later birthday is Grim Grimoire I got this on my 19th birthday, so this would have been 2007, whereas Aladdin I probably got that around my 8th or 7th birthday or something, which would have been in the mid 90s. But yeah, I got this on my 19th birthday, and it was really, I think this was the only thing I remember about my 19th birthday, because I didn't really do much on my 19th birthday, but I think I got it, and um, I think it was from money that my dad gave me, I don't remember, I think we went out and I spent money that he gave it that he gave me for my birthday but it's a vanillaware game and it's basically kind of like an RTS and I know the whole thing about RTS's aren't very good on consoles but this one didn't really require too much it didn't have too much of the RT element of RTS you didn't really have to hurry up because you could pause the game and then select things for individual units and it was based in this magical school kind of like this Harry Potter type setting apart from you have these different elements so for example you have glamour which is the greeny element and that's full of fairies and you use those to gather the crystal resources you also have alchemy which is very much based on technology and machines very orange theme going on with that you have sorcery which is all about fire and it's all red and demons and then you have necromancy which is all about the dead, the living dead, the undead, or whatever. And I really like that theming. I thought that that theming of, you know, those elements of glamour, alchemy, sorcery, and necromancy were really, really interesting over the standard fire, water, wind, you know, that lot. Also, one thing I remember about this game was, and this is quite unusual for a PS2 game, but it was quite late in the PS2 life cycle that I played this game, and that was that it didn't really show up very well on a small screen, so my friend Josh, for example, he had a screen that you attached to a PS2, 
and that's what he used to play PS2 games. And I tried it on that, and the screen was just too small, just could not see the text at all. It was a bit of a problem. Although it was a bit of a problem with other games as well, I suppose. Number 270 is a game called Smart As. Yeah, it's a very strange name. You would think it would be called Smart Ass, but no, it's Smart As. And I think the idea is that it's meant to be a play on, not just a play on the words for Smart Ass, but also as if to say, like, you are smart as this thing. This is a Vita game. The reason I got this game originally was because I had some credits for a shopping site and didn't really have anything I wanted. And it had some games on, so I figured I'd get some Vita games. And this was one of them. And this is one of those brain training type games. But I've got to say, I think this one in particular is really good. You've got different types of categories for challenges. So, like for example, you've got the wordy ones, you've got the pure mathematics ones, and then you've also got ones to do with memory and logical thinking, that type of thing. And the variety of different challenges in these games are, I think it's a really good challenge. And also, you have different levels of challenges where it can get really hard. Like sometimes, like in the memory one, you'll have one where you have to remember a list of items and sometimes the list can be like eight items and you've got to remember the order that they appear in. And sometimes it can get really complicated. An example of the word game would be ones where, you know, there's missing letters and you've got to write in the letters because it uses the touchpad as a primary feature. And there were also challenges like, I think it was one of the logic challenges where you had to connect poles together but you weren't allowed to make the paths cross each other yeah it was it was an interesting game I, I thought for what it was it did it really well also it was narrated by John Cleese just a little thing to add into that number 269 is Sonic the Hedgehog 4 episode 1 uh, this came out in 2010 and really this game not so much that it was highly expected to be but it was brought out with high standards I suppose because people were with a name like Sonic the Hedgehog 4 episode 1 people had high expectations for what it could be and people were expecting it to be like the earlier Sonic games which it is but I think it really falls short the way that it works is you have four levels total which for a Sonic game is tiny but the idea is that you know it's episode 1 so it's meant to be like a small part but then again, it did come out for like £10, so, you know, it's there's that. But the main issue that everyone had was the controls. The way that there wasn't really much going on in terms of momentum. If you just stopped pressing the button on the controller, you would just come to a complete stop instantly. And all that sort of stuff. And also there was the fact that there was the homing attack. I wasn't too keen on this game, really, overall, as a Sonic game. What I also didn't really like was how the levels seemed to be just be rehashes of, of levels from previous games so yeah you had splash hill but i mean you know it's expected to have a so-and-so hill as the first level but then you also had that other level which was blatantly a metropolis zone mad gear and then you had the labyrinth zone which you know blatantly labyrinth zone which i can't remember exactly what it was called lost labyrinth or something like that but yeah the levels are just a blatant copy of the other levels from the other Sonic games and there was also the casino one as well and the bosses were as well so Splash Hill just had the Sonic 1 Green Hill boss apart from it swung around its big ball thing for some reason okay tell me if this happened with anyone else but the swinging ball in, in Sonic 1 that you know, that Green Hill boss swinging ball. Did anyone else hear about it being called a bobby knocker? I don't, I've never heard that word before, that term before, or that, that term being used for anything else ever, but I knew someone who said it's a bobby knocker. Is that a word that exists, or did they just make that up? Or did they hear it from somewhere? I don't know. Very strange. But yeah, I didn't like how the bosses were mostly just rehashes. I mean, the Labyrinth boss was sort of different. I mean, people didn't really like the original Labyrinth boss, but I didn't really have a problem with it. But also what made this game different was how the way that you got emeralds was that, yeah, you still jumped in the giant emerald at the end of the stage like you did in Sonic 1. And the Sonic 1 special stages were revisited. Although I will say my strongest point of Sonic 4 Episode 1 is the special stages. I I think are the best special stages that there's ever been in a Sonic game, even better than the Sonic 3 and Knuckles ones. I think they're just, I think the ones here are just amazing. Just Sonic 4 Episode 1, best special stages in the series. 
I will go ahead and say that. The special stages are basically the Sonic 1 special stages, apart from instead of the level automatically rotating, you rotated the level and that was your control, that was your element of control and you had to like guide yourself around these different areas and so much more creativity with them as well. But what I was going to say was that the thing that makes it different as well is that the emeralds that you get, when you get an emerald, it ties that emerald to the stage you got it from, so you can't get the same emeralds or rather you can't use the same level to get more than one emerald so what it's best to do is it's best to get the easier emeralds on the later stages so that obviously the harder special stages you're going to have to keep replaying over and over again so you can get those on the earlier stages like splash hill zone so you could just repeat those because because when you fail a special stage you have to replay the level in order to get to the special ring thing so just save those for the early stages i thought that was a little bit messed up the way that that worked i, I think that it would make more sense to me if sort of like you collected the rings at the end of the level and that unlocked the special stage for you to unlock considering that it did have this save feature where you could keep a track of the levels that you'd been on to and you could replay those levels but anyway Number 268 is Rayman Fiesta Run. Now you may notice that I've put in this far ahead of Rayman Jungle Run, but it's basically the same idea. But I was able to play so much more of this because of the controls. Um, I actually did play this on my phone, and I just felt it was a better game in general. Now obviously, like I said, with Rayman Jungle Run, if I was able to play with better controls, I'd probably be able to have a better view of it. But even still, I did think that this game was better. What I really, really liked about this game was just the amount of levels it presented you with because you had levels in sets of like three or four or whatever and depending on how many lums you got was how many tinsies you saved so once you hit certain checkpoints is how many tinsies that you saved like so say you got like half of them that would be like two tinsies or whatever and you've got all of them that would be all four tinsies and then the way that you unlock levels was based on how many tinsies you'd saved so if you did all the levels in order and just max them out you would unlock so many levels ahead of time and i really like that but other than that i don't really have much to say but Fiesta Run is basically two Rayman Legends as Jungle was to Rayman Origins. But yeah, that's I've basically said everything that needs to be said, at least as far as I'm aware about this game. Number 267 is Kung Fu Rabbit. This is a game that I have on the PS3 and also on the PS Vita, and I've completed it on the PS3, still haven't done the Vita, but this is another platform game, and the way that this game works is you have the different carrots to collect. So every level will have a few normal carrots, and then you have a big carrot, and the big carrots respawn, so you can complete the level once, get all of the carrots, and then you can replay the level, and the big carrot, you can get that again, and it will still add up to your total carrot thing, and the carrots are used to buy power-ups and upgrades. And upgrades include things such as being able to move faster, being able to attack enemies from their non-weak points, such as like from a top, and my favourite one, which was you can create checkpoints. That was one of the things you could buy, so you could buy checkpoints and you could place the checkpoints in the level so that when you died you would reappear at the checkpoints. And so the idea was to go through all the levels and collect all the carrots. And once you've done that, there's this extra mode where you play through all the levels again, but they're actually harder. So like world 1 to fat 1 to 4 is just like the game and then you have worlds 5 to 8 which is the same levels again but with more enemies and more traps and you'll have the different blocks that like appear and disappear and you'll have blocks that disappear once you step on them and of course there's like power ups for that that you can buy and I found that really interesting the way that you can buy these power ups to interact with the levels in different ways. My biggest mistake first time playing through was I grossly overestimated how many carrots I needed to save because by the end I had so many carrots and the last few levels I realised okay I can just create checkpoints every which way here so I made loads of checkpoints along the way and that whole paying for checkpoints thing is a pretty neat idea I've got to say I think it's a uh, really really interesting and I'm, I'm glad to have played a game where they did that this is actually a very recent game that I played I played it in 2015 so yeah also in number 266 we have another game I played in 2015 and that is 
Mousecraft. The best way that I can describe Mousecraft is that it's a mix between Lemmings and Tetris. Of course, it isn't. It's more like Lemmings than Tetris gameplay-wise, but the reason I say Tetris is because you have these blocks that are Tetris block shaped. The idea is on Mousecraft to get all of the mice to the cheese and you want to collect as many crystals as you can. So every level is a puzzle. You'll start with three mice and if you can get all the three mice to the cheese at the end, well done, you've saved all the mice on that level. And also there's these crystals as well. You really only have to save one of the mouth one of the mice to, you know, properly like complete the level, but you know, for the one hundred percent, you have to save them all and get all of the crystals. The way that it works though is that you have the mice when you release the mice they'll just walk forwards and they'll just continue on forwards. Like like lemmings do. But what you actually do in this game is you place the different Tetris blocks and you interact with the different items. So you might pick up a bomb and you can use that bomb to blow up a block or you might have these evil mice who if they touch one of the normal mice they'll kill them. And the further you go the more that you'll discover in terms of features. So for example you might get to a level where it'll introduce water to you and the idea is that the mice can live in water but only for so long so you have to try to get them out of the water. And it's a really interesting game. It's very jigsaw based and very maneuverability based and all that I suppose. The mice themselves can climb one block height but they can only fall I think it's three blocks. If they fall any further than that then they die. So it's a case of lining things up and putting blocks on top of each other in such a way that you can form bridges and just making sure that you can solve the puzzle and that's what I really liked about this game. I really like the, the puzzle element of it I suppose. Number 265 is Sonic Advance. This is a Game Boy version of Sonic the Hedgehog and I think this is one of the final games that I played in the Sonic series where I really had that Sonic feel to it. Whereas later on, even in the 2D games, it seemed to go more towards just massive speed and I suppose I, I'm not too sure, but that's how it felt for the 2D games. So in this game, you could play as Sonic, Tails, Knuckles and Amy. Sonic can do his air attacks or he'll like do a weird short range attack in the air, Tails can fly, Knuckles can glide and climb walls, but Knuckles can also jump just as high as Sonic and Tails, which is not what I'm used to with these 2D Sonic games. I'm used to Knuckles not being able to jump as high, but there you go. And Amy is actually the worst character in the game, but is actually my favourite in that I think it provides the most challenging gameplay, because with Amy, she can't spin dash or her jump, she doesn't turn into a ball or anything, but you have a separate attack button, and that's how you deliver your attack, so you have to manually swing your hammer, and you can do that to also jump up higher in the air, which I thought made it more interesting, because it added that element of difficulty to it. Also, I thought the game was just a, naturally a bit harder than the other Mega Drive Sonic games. Even though, not saying that this is a Mega Drive Sonic game, but you know, the Mega Drive Sonic games that I was used to from before then. And so, I played this game quite significantly, I suppose. I did complete it with all the characters, and I did like some of the levels. I liked the boss on the icy world. I thought that was quite interesting, the way that he dropped the icicles. You have to use the icicles as platforms to reach him. And the final boss is pretty good as well. I found it interesting the way that before you fought the final boss, you actually had to fight the Green Hill boss and the Emerald Hill bosses from Sonic 1 and 2, and it played the music from those games. And strange how I mentioned, isn't it strange how in one part I mention the same boss twice from two different games, but neither of those games are the game that it originates from. Isn't that so weird? But whatever. Another thing that this game had was it had a chow garden. So if you had your chows from one of the Sonic Advance games on the GameCube, you could transfer it over to your Game Boy, and on this Sonic Advance game, you could use your rings that you collected to buy them fruit, and it would change the hunger of the chow. It would also change their stats as well. You could also buy, like, toys for them to play with. There was, like, a trumpet and stuff, and there was a TV, like, the really expensive TV, which I never bought. I don't know. I just never had the will power to like not spend the money that I'd saved, well the rings rather that I'd saved, and you also had weeds that grew in the garden that you picked out. I also remember once trying to just not pick out any of the weeds, see how see how much grass could grow if I just left it, but I think there was a, like a limit to it, I'm not too sure. And I also remember that with the food, there was, there was one particular piece of food that you could give it, which was strange, like it increased its hunger really fast or something, or it actually made it more hungry but decreased stats or something or I don't know. I remember there's like one red fruit that was like really different but it was like really cheap or something. And so that 
is the end of this part for my top 500 games. I will see you in the next part. So thank you all for listening. I'll see you all next time.